part two. This is the part where we're going to talk about and provide the IRS with information about whether or not we've met minimum value and affordability. Okay. Um, so under part two, there are, there are three lines. In particular, I think the, the big takeaway with regards to part two, until we get to the codes, which is a huge takeaway, but, but the, the initial takeaway is that any box that is left blank on line 14 or 16 is going to cause a problem with the IRS. We don't want a problem with the IRS, unless we're aware that that problem is there. So let me explain. Line 14 has to do with, that's the code series one, that has to do with the offer of coverage. Line 14 answers the question, did I offer them coverage? Did I offer this person coverage in any of these months? So you'll see there are 13 boxes. You can't see from that little line, but this first box right here, this is in all 12 months. Another thing to remember about the 1095C is it's a calendar year form. So how many people have a calendar year plan year? How many of you have, obviously don't have a calendar year plan? So there are things that may change in the middle of the year, like contributions or offerings or whether people are taking or not taking coverage that are going to change in the middle of the year. But the form is still a calendar year. So if your plan year changes in the middle of the year and you change your contribution, you change your offering requirements, things can change in the middle of the form. Line 15 is the line that shows the lowest cost option, health plan option available to that particular employee. Now you might have multiple offerings of health plans. Um, if there's one that's a, a more generous plan than the other and it costs a little more, that's not the one you have to use, even if that's the one the employee elected. You want to put down the lowest cost option available that was offered to that employee. If they bought up, they bought up. Because affordability has to do with the fact that you've offered them something that is affordable, right? That dollar amount has to go out to the cents, has to go out to two, two places on the uh, right-hand side of the decimal point, right? Yes? Oh. Um, my question was, do you call it um, single, family, single coverage? Single coverage. Single coverage. Okay. Sorry. There's, there's a lot. It's one of those chicken and egg things when you start talking about this. Do I start here? Do I start here? <laughs> So line 14, we're going to fill in saying, did I offer them coverage? Line 15, we're going to fill in the lowest cost option. Now, one clarification on that, um, the IRS has, has made um, an announcement, I guess it was one of those sort of wonky FAQs as opposed to actual regulatory guidance, um, that said, if I have two plans, one's a compliant plan for wellness purposes, generally speaking, when I'm picking the lowest cost option, I have to use the non-compliant option. I have to assume that my employee will fail the wellness tests, so I can't put in the lowest cost option for having people comply with the wellness requirement. The only exception to that is a tobacco cessation program. <coughs> if, the, if the program is a tobacco cessation program, you can use the, the one where they have to be compliant to get the lowest cost charge in that box. But if it's well living, you have to use the, the non-compliant option. Sure. Um, so we break our premiums <coughs> out by um, officer, junior officer, senior officer. So if somebody is promoted new year or demoted new year, do we have to um, take it to that particular month or can we use the higher costing if they were promoted to an officer? Can we use that one the whole year because that would be a higher premium for them to pay? So does do they lose the option to pay the lower contribution when they get promoted? Correct. So yeah, so you have to, it has to be the option that, that they have, because this is an employee specific form. Mm -hmm. So if that lower option goes away because I got promoted, mm -hmm. then, um, then you use that. Now remember too, so this is one of the things that you have to sort of keep in the back of your brain. This, this, this part two is where the IRS is trying to determine whether or not you're subject to the penalty, mm -hmm. right? So there, there are going to be a lot, there are going to be several occasions when you're going to have a contribution amount that's not affordable. That doesn't mean it's an automatic penalty because I put an amount down this because those people are on your plan, right? They haven't gone off to the exchange and gotten a subsidy, which is when that occurs. So it'll be monthly, so the change you'll actually put in that next subsequent month, you put the new rates in there. It's no different than if you're a non-calendar year, you renew, you change your contribution level, so maybe 
uh, January through June, it's one number. July, we renewed, we changed our contribution levels. That lowest cost plan now is this, so I have to put that new number in there. And they'll be testing each month for the affordability plan. So you may have, you may have, you know, same, 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 same. Somebody gets promoted, different, different, renewal, different, different, you know, you know what I mean? So, because of the, the change in October. Yeah. Okay. And there's opportunities to skip that line all together, so maybe that's where I would take it. There you go. So okay. line 16 then, line 16 of the two series code numbers, that, um, that line answers the question, why shouldn't you penalize me? That's the, the, the so you're going to show through the code, so you're going to tell the IRS why I shouldn't be penalized. And there's several codes that may apply, some of them trump others, we'll go through those particularly. So on the first line we're saying, here's how I comply, here's why. Here's why I've offered coverage. Here's how I've offered coverage. Second line is going to be the actual contribution amount, up two decimal points. And the third line is going to be, but you shouldn't penalize me because. And there'll be a reason, and there's several reasons. I got an easy one for you. Okay, because you're running out of questions. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> an employer that is um, 20 employees, okay, they're off um, cycle on the renewal, they're on August 1st. Okay, they went from fully insured to self-funded starting August 1st. They just have to fill out the lines going from August forward? Well, first it's a B series because they're small. Okay. So they don't have part two at all. Okay. There's that. So I don't know, Mike may be able to answer, but my thought but is for, the insurance But for self-funded, they have to do 1095C, right? If they're yeah, they're self self-funded in 1095C parts one and two. Right. That's they it. get the B part three from the carrier. And then I guess in that one spot up there where it says plan start month, if it was August, it'd just be 08. Where are you? Uh, is that the renewal? Yeah. Is, is August? Yeah, with the transition rule, they wouldn't start until that month. Now they'll still have put codes in there, and we'll go through those codes where they'll actually say, I'm, tra I'm a, I'm a, a mid-year transition, so I'll use these codes, which means, in essence, I'm not eligible for penalties until my actual renewal in 2015. So anybody that's not calendar year, you're not under the employer mandate until your actual renewal. As long as you had a plan in place prior to uh, December 3rd, 2012 or something like that. There's some specifics up there. Well, that so, but all of part two is not applicable. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So we've talked in specifics about part two, line 14. We're going to put in the applicable code that identifies how I've offered coverage to that employee. Under what scenario? Um, if the offer was made to that in person for the entire calendar year, they were being offered coverage for all of 2015, then we can fill out the same code across the whole spectrum, January to December, the same reason it was offered. Um, then they can, uh, you can fill out the all 12 months box. Uh, so you have to have a code on every, every box, or either the all 12 box, all 12 months box, or every box January through December on line 14. Right. There has to be some sort of code because there are codes for didn't offer coverage as well. So you want to make sure that you're, you've either marked and put the code in that applies to every single month in 2015 that's the same, or you filled in every single box January to December of line 14. Okay. On, um, uh, then you're going to enter the, uh, the code identifying the type of health coverage that's actually offered to the employer. I mean, as you it's getting a ton of time. As you, as you, as an employer that you've offered to the employee. So, if you offer full coverage, employee spouse dependent coverage, you're going to offer into that kind of a code. If you um, only have employee and dependent coverage, you're going to offer those types of codes, right? Um, so you're going to make sure that that you uh, you enter the right kind of code, and we're going to go over those again specifically. Um, and then you do not enter a code for any other type of health coverage. The, the, the employer is treated as having offered, um, but the employee was not actually offered. So if you have multiple plans, so if you have management plans, a couple options there, and you have hourly plans, a couple options there, don't put codes in for, for plans that they aren't actually eligible for and offered coverage on. Um, here are the list of the codes, and again, Mike's going to go through these really specifically. They get into to, um, actually the, the heart of affordability. A qualifying offer, not to be confused with a qualifying health plan under the exchange, but a qualifying offer means that you're offering 
coverage, minimum essential, minimum value, affordable coverage, to the employee where the contribution is less than 9.5% of the mainland single federal poverty limit number for 2015, which in this case is $11,770. So if your contribution in general for all your employees is less than, or for this employee, but, um, is less than 9.5% um, of $11,700. It's $92 and change. There you go, $92 and change. Um, one of the things, Mike, I did want to ask you about from yesterday, and this may be a good time to talk about this, is, is as an employer, are we allowed to select a affordability option by employee? Or are we selecting that by employer for that plan? There are some, some <laughs> carve-out options, but it's really limited, just like the, uh, you know, we talked about yesterday, the carve-outs look back. Mm -hmm. It's very limited. Um, I think this goes back to Keep it simple. Um, it's going to be more difficult if you have complexity. You know, we're going to do this class this way, this class this way. It's going to add some, add some uh, uh, burdens to your administrative responsibilities. I think you want to keep this across the board and keep it simple. One way is the, the rate of pay is one way to help do that. Maybe that's something that these guys So if you, in general, when you looked at your contributions for 2015 when we were going through that process, if the contribution you have um, offered to your employees is less than nine and a half percent of that federal poverty limit, then you you can use the one A qualifying offer um, code on line fourteen. Outside of that, then you get into some very specifics, and and Michael go through uh, you know the hierarchy of these codes. So sometimes multiple codes apply, and when do I pick one code over another? And that's this afternoon's discussion. But you'll see as we go through, well, 1B, minimum essential coverage providing minimum value offered to the employee only. My plan is an employee only plan, that's a 1B. Um, it might be based on 9.5% of the federal poverty limit, but I'm not offering coverage to spouses and dependents. So it's the difference between those two codes, and that's how they fall as you go down. So 1C, minimum essential coverage providing minimum value offered to the employee, and at least minimum essential coverage offered to dependents. So in this case, and we had talked about this um, in one med venue, you might set your contributions to be affordable for the employee only. I offer coverage to spouses and dependents, but I charge them a lot more. I make up the difference in my for my employee contribution, and I charge more to employees and dependents. Does so, that make your car out spouses on your plan? Now, all together or based on them having coverage elsewhere, how do you? All together. You just carve out spots all together. Okay. So that's a good example that Caroline's bringing up. You would be eligible to use 1A because that says you're offering benefits to your spouses as well. So you would actually revert to 1C for the, probably the majority of the uh, one series codes that you end up using. Yeah. And you're allowed to do that. You're, it's okay to do that. You just got to make sure you put it properly. And this is a good example, too, of if you're a major plan year, and let's say the first half of the calendar year, you did offer to spouses. And so you might be a 1A for the first half of the year, and then I carve my spouses out the second half of the year, and now I'm down to a 1C. So I wouldn't be able to use that all 12 months box. I would have to actually put the specific code in that applied for month. Would it work any differently? We offer um, coverage to spouses so long as they don't have their own coverage. So that still be so you're doing 1095C specific to each individual, so you'll have to understand, okay, which individuals is a spouse offered coverage, which ones, which ones are not. So you might have one employee where we offer benefits to the spouse, They're, they stay home, they don't have benefits elsewhere, I maybe can use 1A. The next employee, we don't offer it to that spouse because because they have benefits elsewhere, I need one c for that employee. So you're gonna have that difference on each one. Okay. Yeah. Um, 1D, minimum essential coverage providing minimum value offered to the employee and at least minimum essential coverage offered to the spouse but not dependents. So, anybody know what possible problem might happen here? It's like a little mini quiz. So remember, under health care reform, if we're going to avoid the greater penalty, the 4980HA penalty, we have to offer coverage to all employees and dependent children, right, to age 26. There's a code here, if you decided to heck with it, um, not complying, you get to be compliant on your form and tell them that. Um, but, but there's a code to, to, um, to notify the IRS of that. 
1E, minimum essential coverage providing minimum value offered to employee, and at least essential coverage offered to dependents and spouses. So next to 1A, if I'm offering minimum essential coverage, minimum value, um, and I'm, I'm making every effort for it to be affordable under one of the safe harbors, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use 1A or 1E. Those are going to be my, my go-to codes. Right? 1E means that I'm offering it and it's affordable, but I'm not using the federal poverty level safe harbor. I may be using the W-2 rate, uh, rate, or the rate of pay safe harbors instead to determine affordability. 1F, minimum essential coverage not providing minimum value. Um, if you're a MedBen employee, you all have minimum value plans. We've checked all of them, we've done that work. I mean, unless you're offering something else we don't know about. So it's one of the things that we're managing and monitoring, you all have minimum value. Um, in this case, if you're not offering uh, minimum value and you're um, providing that to the employee or the employee and the spouse or the employee spouse and dependents, that's where you use 1F, meaning it's not a minimum value plan. 1G, you're offering coverage to the employee who is not a full-time employee. So if you offer coverage to part-time employees or retirees or you have uh, COBRA people or township trustees or elected officials or any of those other individuals that you cover under your plan, right? for any month that you're covering somebody who's not a full-time employee but that they're enrolled in the plan, you're going to use 1G. 1H, no offer of coverage. I'm not offering them, and it's not, I'm not offering them coverage. There could be a number of reasons, but primarily these are going to be people who are offered health coverage um, and who aren't on the plan. It might be because they're, they weren't my employee. So it's a calendar year four. Maybe I didn't hire somebody until June, and there's, Mike has some really good examples this afternoon to go through that. But if I don't hire somebody, the form still has to be filled out right. I still need something in those boxes or I have an alert to the IRS. So 1-H is they were my employee. 1-H is also what you're gonna use if you have COBRA people who are on COBRA due to termination. I'm offering them coverage, and I gotta give them a form, but they're not my employees. I didn't have to offer them coverage. I had to give them COBRA, but for healthcare <coughs> reporting purposes, I didn't have to offer them coverage from an affordability perspective because they're no longer my employee. The other scenario would be it's a full-time employee for the month that I didn't offer benefits to, and that's the very right. employee risk that we'll talk about here in a little bit too. That's right. I, so one of the things we talked about is that these are full months. So if you terminate someone in the middle of the month, then there are different. There's a different way to work the codes. You can't have a code that says that you offered them coverage for a whole month if, you, if they were terminated mid-month or they were eligible and they started um, started coverage mid-month. Those sort of things. And Mike has some examples for that. Um, and, and the last one, um, one I, uh, qualified offer transition relief, employee and or spouse independence received no offer um, because as an employer I was eligible for some transition relief and I didn't have to offer that coverage to those individuals. So Mike's going to go through those really specifically. We talked about line 15. Line 15 gets filled out if you have one of the codes that are, are listed up here, 1B, C, D, or E. The reason is, if you put in 1A, right, qualifying offer affordable based on a minimum po uh, federal poverty level, that amount is a sort of set amount. I don't have to put it in because I'm not calculating a percentage of salary or a percentage of a rate of pay that is unknown to the IRS. The IRS knows what the federal poverty level is. They know that that amount that you said, you do a testing on the form that the contribution that you're charging that person is less than nine and a half percent of eleven thousand seven hundred and seventy dollars or ninety two dollars and change per month. So you don't have to put the amount in on 15. If you put in one of these codes, then you have to put in the actual dollar amount that is the lowest cost option. Okay. Again, you would enter the amount including the cents. Um, if you have a zero, if you if you you completely offer coverage to your employees at no cost, and you are not using 1A, and you have so you have to put a dollar amount in, right? Then, um, then you have to put the zero, 0, 0.00. You have to put that dollar amount in. Now, my suggestion, and this is just my suggestion, if you have, a, um, you are offering coverage to your employees at 100%, you pay the entire cost. I would suggest that you make your um, your affordability option 1A, a qualifying health offer, because it is less than 9.5% of federal poverty. And 
and then if you do that, you don't even have to go through and put all the zeros in because you don't have to put a number into line 15. Does that make sense to you, Mike? Is that what you're doing? Yes. Um, so again, if the amount is the same for all 12 months, if you're, you're fortunate enough to be a calendar year plan and that contribution has stayed the same the whole time, you can put it in the all 12 months box. Um, and if you did not offer coverage um, or if offered coverage, health coverage was not minimum essential coverage or didn't provide minimum value, then you don't put in 15. You don't fill in 15 at all. It's not minimum essential or minimum value. All right. Let me run through the B penalty itself. What it is that the IRS is measuring for, how does that work, what is actually the penalty risk? So the B penalty is the affordability penalty. Was the benefit that was offered to the employee affordable? Or in fact, if it wasn't offered, obviously it's not affordable. So this is what we're testing for, or the IRS is testing for with lines 14, uh, 15, and 16. Uh, how that works is if you have an employee that goes to the marketplace, they go to the exchange, they apply for insurance, based on their income, uh, they may qualify for premium subsidy. The uh, income is bounced off the federal uh, poverty table up to 400%. They look at their um, modified adjusted gross income for the year. <coughs> Give you an example, this year, I believe it's $94,000 for family of four. So if your income for your family of four is less than 94,000, you can qualify for premium subsidy. If, the employee, if that individual gets a premium subsidy, regardless of how much it is, that is a trigger for you as an employer to have to pay the penalty. They don't get a premium subsidy, you don't pay a penalty. They get a premium subsidy, you pay a penalty. So that's where the variable risk comes into play. Um, if, they don't go, if they don't get insurance through the marketplace, obviously they don't get a premium subsidy, we're not paying penalties of them. If they get it for six months of the year, we're, we're at risk for six months. They don't qualify for premium subsidy to make them money. We, we don't have to pay penalties. So that is the trigger that we have to be aware of. But if we have an individual that we offer coverage to and it's not deemed affordable, uh, or we don't offer coverage, so we have a variable hour part-time employee, they work full-time for us in any given month, we didn't offer benefits to that part-time employee, they have premium subsidy in the marketplace, we're paying a penalty. The maximum penalty for the year, and it just was indexed this year, is $3,126. So that's the, that's the maximum penalty for one person that's, that has unaffordable insurance through you. All the penalties are tracked and accrued on a monthly basis as you're filling out your forms, just as we were talking about. I'm going to complete every single month of the year that I offer benefits was affordable. So you actually, the, the variable risk to you is that in order to pay the entire penalty, it must have been affordable or they were full-time and you didn't offer benefits for the entire 12 months. If it's month by month, it's 1 12th of the 3126, which I think is like 260 bucks. Um, somebody can check me on that, but it's around 260 dollars as an example. So I have a part-time employee, for whatever reason, works full-time hours for me in January. They have a premium subsidy in the marketplace. I'm going to have to pay a penalty because the IRS says we just paid a subsidy out for this individual and we want to recoup it. So we're going to recoup it from you all. Um, these subsidies, the way that works in the marketplace, if you're familiar or not familiar, the individual goes in, if they qualify for a subsidy, they're going to make their, they're going to pay their portion of the premium to the carrier, Blue Cross Anthem. Uh, the, the IRS is going to pay the difference, the subsidy amount to that carrier as well, offset the difference. So they just want to recoup those dollars back. So that's how they're going to do this. So your challenge is obviously understanding who, who is it that we're at risk for penalties? Is the, is the coverage we're currently offering to our full-time employees, is it affordable? If not, how many of those employees are we at risk for, for subsidies on? Uh, do we have part-time employees? Do we have variable hour employees that occasionally work full-time hours during a given month? Every time that happens, remember back to January, every month that happened, we exposed ourselves to a penalty here for time employees is understanding when they hit 130 hours that's considered full time for the month under ACA rules. How many of those do we have? We don't know if they're in the, in the marketplace of the premium subsidy or not, but if they are, we're at risk for these penalties. And then obviously I have 10 employees this month that, that had marketplace premium subsidies. We didn't offer affordable coverage to them. I'm looking at about a $2,600 penalty for the month. Um, obviously, if, if we're kind of just getting started here with our reporting, going back to January 1st, we really didn't pay attention to this. We don't know. We didn't manage our variable hour employees or part-time type employees. 
and we're not really sure what risk we're at until we sit down and do the calculation. So uh, it certainly is a risk, and as you move forward in 2016, it's something you want to get your handle on. Say, okay, I need, I need to understand this because we don't want to pay cash fund to pay this bill from the IRS when it shows up. But Mike, there is some protection in using the look back measurement period. <laughs> Talk through that as well. It's just, this is under the general measurement rules, and we'll compare the in the next session. Any questions on the penalty itself? Oh, let's track what they're doing here. Okay. As far as affordability percentage um, or options, so the, the general law was actually written and it said in order for you to understand if the offer of coverage that you provide to your employees is affordable or not, that you want to get the tax returns for every one of your employees, determine if what you charge from an insurance perspective is less than 9.56% of their modified just gross income. So uh, very uh, unfeasible that you're going to be able to do that. I don't think anybody here wants to get tax returns for all your employees. So they came out and said, hey, let's let's create some safe harbors. Here's the general law. Here's how it works. Here's a safe harbor. If you want to plan a new sandbox, we've created some new rules. Those safe harbors now are something that is feasible for us. As an example, we can use the employee's W-2 gross income. I can look at the gross income. And I can set my premium based on that. So an example of that, somebody makes $15,000 a year. If I set my premium at 9.5% of that, then I know it's affordable to that person and everybody that makes more. So if I want to make sure I'm trying to avoid these penalties, I can use the W-2 safe harbor because I don't have to know what they make at home if I use one of these safe harbors and I've protected myself. Another safe harbor that we talked about is the federal property line. It's 11000 and change, about $92 and change is the single rate. If I set my single premium at that $92 or less, let's say I set it at 90 bucks a month. So for single coverage, the lowest cost, middle central value of coverage plan is $90 a month for that employee, and I'm going to adopt the federal poverty line safe harbor. That means it's affordable to every single employee. Doesn't matter how much they make, because I'm using this standard as my safe harbor. Some of you may already be in that bucket. Great, I can use 1A, and I don't have to answer line 15, uh, which is the total amount for the health insurance coverage, so that's one to use. The rate of pay literally says I have a different rate based on their rate of pay, 9.5% of whatever the rate of pay is. Administratively, nightmare. Um, I think if you go down that path, you're charging a different rate for every single employee based on what their income is. You certainly can do that. Uh, it is acceptable. Uh, it, it, it would be difficult to manage. But I think you're probably looking at one of the two here. If you're going to adopt a safe, you know, you don't have to adopt a safe harbor. You certainly can revert to this. We will talk about this this afternoon. If you didn't choose a uh, safe harbor, the other thing you can do as well. And Caroline hit on this. You don't have to make it affordable if you don't want to. It just means we put ourselves at risk for these fee penalties. So I've decided. All right, my penalty risk is thirty-one hundred dollars approximately if somebody has a marketplace premium subsidy for the entire year. But if I make it affordable and I put and I put them on the plan, my subsidy level is about five grand for that person, or significantly more to take family coverage as an example. So maybe I don't make it affordable because it costs them more if they come on the plan than if they than if I have to pay a penalty for them. Understand that works today. The thirty one hundred was three thousand last year. When thirty one hundred is going to continue to index, so that strategy today may not work in the future. The goal here is everybody's supposed to have insurance. Employers are supposed to be the biggest conduit of that, uh, besides the marketplace. So they do want you covering your employees for insurance. So you may have to reevaluate that on a yearly basis based on the penalty and the changes. Now it may be, may be more cost effective to actually put them on our plan than pay the penalty. But it's a, but it's a strategy that you can certainly consider. The other thing is um, that not only is the the penalty being indexed, but we just learned that the the nine and a half percent. Um, say it was not, it's 9.66% for 2016, for 2016 uh, affordability analysis. So, so both numbers are sort of. It was 9.5 and 24 to 9.56 this year. Yeah. So, yeah. Our yes. city council is elected. <clears throat> Several years ago, they passed legislation that they would not be offered health care coverage. Well, Where so, are we? <laughs> uh, well, I can tell you. So I've, I've talked to several uh, public employers about the same situation. So do they work for you? We're going to talk about a common law employee situation a little bit later. But do they work for city for more than thirty hours a week? No. 
Okay, so then they wouldn't be considered a common law full-time employee. You can offer them coverage, but you don't have to worry about the affordability part. You don't have to worry about the penalty part, because they would be considered a part-time employee. You could certainly offer them coverage as a part-time employee. Um, so I work with um, another um, a county in Indiana, and their commissioners do work 30 hours. And so they, they're in the middle of a, just you know, sort of a side note, in the middle of a sort of a political issue where the county is trying to save money and they're not sure they want to offer these commissioners coverage and they're trying to figure out because they do work this number of hours. I mean, so you have to look at all of those situations independently and make a determination about are they your employee? You know, are they a common law employee? And I would say, yes, they're working for you, right? You're, you're paying them. They're not, you're not hiring them from some other pool. They were elected. They're working on behalf of the city. And then um, on top of that, how many hours are they working? Um, if it's if they're really if it's really five hours a week or something, you're probably safe. If you think oh, I, I really don't know, it might get over thirty. Then there, there may be some measuring you want to do or some sort of timekeeping that you ask them to do. I know that's hard. They're elected officials. I know. I know. I because I, I had this discussion with the other kind of, I can't ask them to do that. I'm like, well, I don't want to tell you. But um, but if it's close, because that's still a liability on you. If they do get over. All right, so we talked about line 14 and, and line 15, and now we'll talk about line 16. And again, line 16, this is the two series codes. This is, we're answering the question or trying to explain to the IRS why I shouldn't be penalized. I'm gonna put a code in there that tells you, um, Mr. IRS agent, why no matter what else I put on this form, I, um, I, I don't have to pay a penalty for that one or for all 12 months. Um, so we're gonna enter the code. We're gonna look at the codes here in a second. Um, and if the offer is made for the entire calendar year, again, we can put that in the first column. Otherwise, we have to put it in um, January through December. Now, unlike 14, on line 14, we've got to fill in every single box, either the all 12 months or January through December. On line 16, we can leave a blank. But no, if you leave a blank, you're leaving a blank because there is no answer and there is a potential for penalty. There's a, there, that's, that's where the IRS is going to go, oh, there's this hole. That's why I'm going to look. That somebody might owe some money for that month because it's blank because they don't have an answer to answer the question. You know, what? Why shouldn't I be penalized? That's a hint for the quiz winner. <laughs> <laughs> I, I always think you you know, give some some little hints, right? Um, so you're going to enter the the um, code two series in in the form on line 16 in the applicable month. Um, if any um, line 16 you report one or more months in the calendar year, which one of the following situations apply to the employee? So you're going to have to look at this again by employee in these particular situations. So you're going to enter if the employee was not employed or was not a full-time employee, right? Um, if the employee was enrolled in minimum essential coverage offered, if the employee was in a limited non-assessment period. Um, so we'll spend a little bit more time on that, but when you think, hear the words, the big words, limited non-assessment period, it's a waiting period. Under healthcare reform now, we have a couple different kinds of waiting periods. We have the waiting period where if you're a full-time employee, right, you have to be offered coverage within no more than 90 days. That's the waiting period. That's our high-tech refrigerator that sounds like, you know, we're not under a terrorist attack. It's just our refrigerator likes to tell us that it thinks it's open, but it's not. Um, uh, it also is that measurement period, that look-back measurement period that you may be using to, to measure the time period and a variable, a new variable hour employee, right? That's a waiting period. That's a period of time that you're not offering coverage because you don't know whether you have to offer them coverage because they're a variable hour and you don't know whether they've averaged 30 hours over that measurement period or not. It's a type of waiting period. So there's a code that, that sort of, make, that Mike calls it the get out of jail free code, which I love. That means, you know, I'm not offering coverage because I don't know or somebody's in a waiting period. It's a great code and stick that in because because it's clock, we're not just going to use it, you know, uh, irreverently. But we'll put that code in when it applies, and it will save us from those periods of time when people are in a waiting period and we didn't actually have to offer them coverage yet. Um, if you're in a non-calendar year transition relief situation as an employer, we're going to go over some of that that specifically. Um, meaning these, these this you're a, you're a mid-year plan year, and these rules don't apply to you yet because you're rolling into compliance during 2015. 
Um, the employer did meet one of the affordability safe harbors with respect to the employee, so you're going to say, I, I did, I met that, don't penalize me, I met that. And there are specific codes with regards to each type of uh, safe harbor available. Or the employee was eligible from a multi-employer interim uh, rule, and we don't have any multi-employers, so yay, because that gets really complicated. Uh, so these are the two series codes specifically. Again, there's a trump code uh, here. It's 2C. We'll get to that in a minute. But 2A, you enter 2A if the employee was not employed on any day of the month. You don't use 2A for the month if the individual isn't employed on any day of the month. So again, if you are employed any time during that month, then you have to look to a different code. But if I wasn't employed at all during the month, then I'm going to use 2A. And that could be because I wasn't an employee, you didn't even know I existed yet. Or it could be that I um, was a COBRA participant, and so I wasn't employed because I was on COBRA due determination. But I might have some coverage things going on in this form, and I might be owed a form, but I'm not, I'm not an employee. Or it could be that I'm an elected official, and I, in my world, that are not employees. Or I could be um, a township trustee, or a retiree who is an employee, or something like that. That's what 2A is for. 2B, you can enter 2B if the employee is not a full-time employee for the month um, and did not enroll in minimum essential coverage if offered. So I got part-time employees, right? I'm not a full-time employee. Um, I'm a part-time employee, and I might have been offered, uh, had coverage available, um, but I didn't enroll in it. So and I, maybe later in the year, I did, but now I didn't. So we have some, we've got a form going on. I have a form I've got to fill out. But I have a situation where I've got somebody who is a part-time employee that, that um, didn't enroll in the coverage. Um, you're also going to enter B if the employee is a full-time employee for the month um, and their coverage ended before the end of the last day. So how many people have coverage, even if you terminate in the middle of the month, you roll to the end of the month, you coverage to the end of the month? And the rest of you don't. So the rest of you have to think about, 2B two, two is an important one for you. Um, because if, if I'm terminated in the middle of the month, I'm going to have to use 2B from some of my full-time employee coverage. Um, you're also going to use that for um, January 2015 if the employee was offered coverage no later than the first day of the first payroll period. So with some of you, I actually can't remember who I've spoken with about the fact that they were enrolling measurement periods and, and enrollment from using payroll dates. So this may not necessarily apply to you if you're running measurement periods and enrollment from your first payroll in the year. 2C, again, this is a Trump, Trump code. Michael will go over this specifically. If multiple um, codes apply, including 2C, 2C usually wins out. Um, you're going to enter 2C for any month in which the employee enrolled in health coverage offered by the employee, regardless of whether any other code series to apply. We'll see how those work together. This is your high school or college test. It says, all right, there's four answers below. There's multiple correct answers. Which one is most correct? So you're supposed to understand that. Code D, enter two, uh, D, uh, two D for any month during which an employee is in the limited non-assessment period. So during that period of time when I'm in a waiting period, um, whether it's an initial look back measurement period or a waiting period, I'm going to use 2D. And 2E, and we use that for any month in which uh, there's a multi-employer issue. Two F use code two F if the employer used uh, the the W two safe harbor code um, in fourteen. So there are situations where we're going to look at the the uh, affordability options we picked and used for our line fourteen codes, and we're going to start matching some of these up. And this is where they start they can overlap with two C because it may be that two F and two C both apply. Um, if I'm using W two safe harbor. Um, I might all, Michael go this because I'll get it all wrong, but he knows when they trump each other. Um, but there, as we go through these codes, G, of course, is the, uh, the federal poverty level safe harbor, and H is the rate of pay safe harbor. So you can see there's specifics here, but there are going to be times when 2C is going to trump even these. This, that may, 2F may be perfectly correct, but two, if 2C also applies, then I use 2C. Did I get that? Relatively correct. Okay. Uh, 2I and 2I have a non calendar year transition relief again applies to that employee. So I, I'm off, so I haven't fully moved into healthcare reform in my 2015 plan year yet. 
All right, so we talked a little bit about what a limited non-assessment period is. And generally, again, um, it's, it's a waiting period. And there are multiple kinds of waiting periods. There's a waiting period where I wait to make sure that I have coverage on a full-time employee. I can't have a waiting period that's more than 90 days. First, if anybody still has one that's first of the month following 90 days, that is too long now. It has to be no more than 90 days. Um, and if the employer won't be subject to the penalty, so you, you, even though you're not offering somebody coverage during that, if you have variable hour employees and you're calculating the number of hours they worked and you don't know yet whether you have to offer them coverage, that year wait, which may coincide with the entire calendar year or is more likely part of that calendar year and will roll into the next year. If I hire somebody in July on a 1095C, again, on January to December, right? I'm going to start, I'm going to have a non-employee code up through the first part of the year because they weren't my employee. And then I'm going to have a limited non-assessment code after that because I don't have to offer them coverage until I know that I have to offer them coverage.